Okay, good. So this is the talk on the historical critique of Islam. This is uh, this is not like the what, what we've been doing up to now. We've been looking at mostly apologetics. Now we're going on the offense. This is polemics now. This is going in to confront Islam at its very foundations. And we're confronting Islam at its historical foundations. Uh, so before we get in, I just like to start with a word of prayer. So let's go ahead and let's open with prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this session. We want to thank you for this material. We want to thank you, Lord, that you're providing us an enormous amount of new material that uh, we're just now getting a hold of and understanding and being able to use in our ministries and also with our Muslim brothers and sisters. And so as we unpack it today, uh, we ask that your, will, your spirit will just superintend everything that has been said and also that has been received. We can put this whole time together in the next hour to two hours in your hands. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now let me say, this is the material that we're going to introduce tonight is the beginning of lots of material on the critique of Islam historically. And <clears throat> the reason why is because we're exponentially moving into, the, uh, into lots of research in this area. So this is kind of a good introductory lecture on why, why they're, well, why we in the West, especially those of us who are Orientalists, uh, we, are, uh, we make no apologies for questioning Islam historically. This has been done by, to Christianity. In fact, historical criticism was created on the Bible. It was historical criticism against this book, the Bible, and the person of Jesus Christ, and who he was, and what he did, and where he lived, and how he was born, and specifically on how he died and rose again. That has been around for, oh, maybe, well, since the 1800s. In, in the end of the 1800s in Germany, yeah, places like Tübingen, University of Tübingen, Wellhausen, maybe you know that name, they were starting to ask very good questions about Christianity asking questions such as, who is Jesus Christ? Did he exist? Who is Abraham? How do we know that we can trust uh, the first 11 chapters of the Bible? What about the documentary hypothesis? All these kind of questions. And they start bringing up source criticism. Where are the sources for the Old Testament? Where are the sources for the New Testament? Redacted criticism was much of the New Testament written in the 4th century AD and the 5th century and redacted back to the 1st and 2nd century. These were good questions. And these are the kind of questions that every, any revel uh, revelation needs to go through. But it was begun with the Bible, and it was begun in the late 1800s. And it was so devastating as these kind of questions coming out of Germany, moving into Europe, moving onto the university campuses, filtering down onto the university campuses, and then from there into the seminaries, and from there into the churches, and there from there into the pews, that by 1905, it pretty well decimated the church in Europe along with Darwinianism. So historical criticism, questioning the validity of the Bible, questioning the validity of who Jesus was, what he did, what he said, questioning everything we know about the historical antecedents, the emergence of Christianity, even the questioning the historicity and the validity of the Old Testament, that historical criticism along with Darwinianism devastated the church. And the church has never really recovered in Europe. So that today, if you go anywhere in Northern Europe, or Western Europe, I should say, or Northern and Eastern Europe as well, roughly 5% of the people go to church. Now, the majority of people will call themselves Christians, but those who are actually believing, those who actually follow uh, Jesus Christ, who actually live it out in their own lives, it got, it's only about 5%. And this has been the problem because in 1905, we had no response to this kind of criticism. And since 1905, we've gone back and we found answers to the documentary hypothesis. We can pretty well now answer uh, redacted criticism, source criticism, literary criticism, all the higher and lower criticisms we can now answer. And that's one reason why Christianity and the Bible and the person of Jesus Christ is the only book and the only religion that has been able to answer every one. But we were the first to be able to do that. We were the first to go through that, and we were the first to be able then to respond to it. So that's been about 100 years that we've had that chance to do that. Islam has never done that. 
we, Islam would never do that. It is something that is unique to Christianity. We are very self-critical. And because that self-criticism has been there from the 1800s on, we're way ahead of everybody else. And that's why when I was in seminary, uh, I studied historical criticism. I studied redacted criticism. I studied source criticism, all these literary criticisms, and I was able to then be conversant in it. And that's one reason why it's done me well when I talk to Muslims, because Muslims are one of the first to throw these criticisms at me. Having read all the books that have been written on it, we are very transparent in Christianity. Now we're going to move that whole edifice of what we know as historical criticism, and we're going to now, and we are now putting it onto Islam. And that's what we're going to do tonight. And that's what I'm going to be doing tonight. I'm going to introduce this, but there will be many lectures on this. This is not the only one. This will be the first of many on the, on the historical critique of the Quran. This is my signature piece. This is what I'm known for all around the world. If you go up on Fander Films, on Fander Films, and you see what I'm doing right now, you will see that I'm using historical criticism on the seventh century. I'm asking the question, is there anything in the seventh century prior to 691, that means prior to Abd al-Malik, that we can put our hands on, that we can see or we can know, that shows us that Islam existed before Abd al-Malik. Is there anything about Muhammad? Is there anything about the Mecca? Is there anything about the Quran? Is there anything written or about the people called Muslims? Or is there any uh, uh, thing written about the religion called Islam? Those are the five areas I'm investigating. Any artifact, any inscription, any letter, anything we can look at that proves that Islam existed prior to 691. And what I'm finding is I'm debunking everything. I've been able to, and it's so easy. No one has really done this before. And that's why it's so easy to use this kind of criticism. So what we're going to do this evening is we're going to debunk Islam historically. Now, this material that I'm introducing today is not what I'm doing on Fander Films. On Fander Films, that's the newest stuff. That's the stuff that's going to be, that, we'll, that I'm putting into lectures. The whole, the whole sequence of the coins that I've been doing since January, those are new. That's all new material. But what we're going to do today is build the, frown, uh, the framework, build the ground, foundation. Go do the groundwork first. So let's start and let's get right into it. And let's talk about this particular uh, criticism and let's go to do that. I'm going to share screen. So uh, there is a PowerPoint. You have the outline. Uh, by the way, did you all get the outline? Are you all? Do you all have the outline? Okay, great. I see. Thanks, Ben. Uh, thanks, Anil. Okay, so you've got the outline. I'm assuming you got it in front of you. What I'm going to do now is share screen, and we're going to go right through the PowerPoint. Now the outline follows the PowerPoint. I had to take all the slides from the outline and put it into. Microsoft Word. So uh, I did that yesterday for you all. So you all have it now. So you can keep it. Uh, but we will be following the PowerPoint and the lecture itself will follow the PowerPoint as well. So let's go ahead and put it on and let's bring it up and we can then get started. Okay, here we are. In search, I call this In Search of the Man because I have In Search of the Book and I have In Search of the Man. These are the two major talks. These are the two major areas that we are really confronting. In search of the man would be Muhammad. In search of the book would be the Quran. And so we're looking at both the book and the man, the book and the man, the book and the man. This is my phrase. I don't know if you know that, but this is, I, uh, uh, th I now have that copyrighted. I didn't do it myself. My team copyrighted that phrase for me. So in the search of the book and the man, this is basically looking at the Quran and looking at Muhammad. Now tonight, we're not looking at the Quran. That will be coming later. We'll do a historical critique on the Quran at a later date. This is looking at Muhammad, looking at who he was, looking at where he lived, looking at what he said, what he did, things like this. So we're going to be going into basically a, uh, a critique of, well, of his sources and his beginning, because this is, the, this is the man that really, for Islam, it really is dependent on two things, one book and one man. And this is the man that we're going to be looking at. So let's go ahead and let's open this up. Now, what do Muslims claim about this man, Muhammad? Whether they are radical, whether they are nominal in the, in the middle, or whether they are liberal on the left. It do, well, except for the liberals, possibly not the liberals over here on the left, but everybody else makes a number of claims about this man, Muhammad. So let's go look at those claims. First and foremost, they would say that for the last 1,400 years, for 1,400 years, 
this man, Muhammad, was the last and the greatest prophet, that he is the seal of all prophets. And they would say that his book, his revelation, the Quran, was sent down only to him, and it is the final and the greatest revelation. So it's the seal of all revelations. So those are the two claims they would make. Now, <laughs> you take those two together and you get the next logical progression. That is, Islam is the final religion based on Muhammad's life and sayings and on the Quranic teachings, on the, what the Quran says. So, conclusion, Islam, by definition, is totally dependent on that book and that man. So we should investigate both the Quran and Muhammad and see if indeed the Muslims are correct. To do this, for this study, we're going to start with Muhammad and the emergence of Islam, because Islam really emerged with him. Now, Muslims, when you get into a conversation with them, they will say, no, 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 no. Islam has always been. Possibly you've heard this before, uh, that, uh, that all, uh, all of uh, the prophets in the prophetic line were Muslims. And so Abraham was a Muslim. Moses was a Muslim. David was a Muslim. Uh, Issa, Jesus, obviously was a Muslim. So they would say that Islam has always been, from the time of Adam, many will say that from the time of Adam, Islam has always existed. But what has happened is that over the, the, the centuries, the Jews corrupted that which God had given to all the prophets. Remember, the belief in Islam is that every prophet has a book. And therefore, there's 145,000, 125,000 prophets. So there's 125 books out there. But the only four that have, re have remained are the Taurat, which is the Torah, the Torah of Moses, uh, would be the Zabur, which would be the Psalms of David. The Injil would be the Gospel of Jesus Christ. And the Quran, which would be the Book of Muhammad. So those are the only four that have been retained, rather clumsy of God that he's lost all the others, or clumsy of all those prophets and their descendants for have lost for having lost so many of the other revelations. Nonetheless, what they would say is that with each subsequent revelation, they, it got corrupted. And so that's why God had to send another revelation and another one. And so the revelation that came to Jesus Christ, the most recent revelation, it was corrupted by the Christian church. And the Taurat and the Zabur were corrupted by the Jews. And so as a result of that, that's why Muhammad had to come. So he was the final uh, prophet that came to then receive the final revelation, which is why they call it the seal of all revelation. It now seals every, relation, every, every revelation that comes previous to that, and it seals every prophet who comes previous to Muhammad. So that's why we need to then look and ask this question. What exactly are, are they claiming? And here is the classical account. This is the account everyone uh, of you have heard. This is the only account that I've ever grown up with. This is the only account I'm sure you've ever grown up with. It's the only account that is taught in our schools, in our Bible schools, our seminaries, in our universities, you name it. And it's this account that you see in front of you right now. This is called the classical account. And it starts with the premise that Muhammad was born in 570. Uh, and he was born to, uh, his father was Abdullah, but Abdullah died about six months before he was born. This is what we call as the traditional account. This comes from the Muslim traditions, okay? That's why I'm bringing it to you now. And so then they say, they say that he lived in Mecca. Uh, his mother, Amina, uh, she died soon after his birth. So he was given over to his uncle, Abu Talib. And so he grew up with Abu Dabal Alib in his formative years. And then he would go up to a cave called the Hira Cave, about a few miles outside of Mecca. And he would meditate. And one day, in, the, uh, in 610, so this is the year 610 now, uh, the, the angel Jibril appears to him. Well, he didn't know it was an angel at first, and so uh, this being appears to him inside this cave and says, Ikra, which means recite or read. And his response was, Ma'ika, I cannot recite, I cannot read. So the angel squeezed him, then repeated again, Ikra, and his response was, Ma'ika. And after each time he would be squeezed by the angel, finally he leaves. Uh, Muhammad alone, after three times doing this, of demanding him to e-read, he says, I cannot read, squeezing him, demanding, cannot squeeze, he then lets him go, and Muhammad returns back to Mecca hurriedly, goes to his wife Khadija, he only had one wife at that time, uh, she was about 25 years older than him, and he, uh, uh, he recounted what he had just said, she had him sit on one leg, and then asked him, is this an angel who's speaking to you? He, she had him sit on another one of her legs while she was sitting down, and asked the same question, and then she disrobed in front of him, and while she was naked, she asked him, is this truly an angel who is speaking to you? 
knowing that an angel would not stay if she was naked. And when he said, yes, this was an angel, she knew he was telling the truth, that this was, uh, must have been uh, an, a true angel. So she goes to her cousin, who's named Waraka ibn Nofal, who is a Nestorian Christian. And uh, you've heard this story before. He then, she then tells him to repeat what he had just said to her, to the Waraka ibn Nofal. And he is the one that turns to Muhammad and says, truly, are you a prophet? This was an angel. You will now receive revelation. So it was a Nestorian Christian who then gives him his authority as a prophet. One of the ironies of history. So from 610 all the way to 622, those are known as the Meccan revelations. As I've said earlier in other talks, if you take a Quran and just turn it, uh, cut it in half, the first part, this part here, this part here are the Meccan revelations. Sorry, the second part. Did I say the first part? Slap me in the mouth. That's not right. I just, I made my first mistake today. I hope that's the only one I'll make. It's the second part. It's the latter part. Basically, if you take your Quran, which you all have in front of you there, I know you all walk around with your Qurans, uh, and just split it in two, you get to around Surah 20. So it's Surah 20 is about the halfway mark. Everything that's at the uh, the second half, which would be uh, would be your Meccan Surahs. Now, there are some Medinan verses in there, but by and large, this is Meccan. The first half is Medinan. And this is the half that was revealed when he was living in Medina after 622. But this is the half that he was revealed, that was revealed to him when he was in Mecca. So from 610 to 622. In 621, he was still there in Mecca. He gets woken up in the middle of the night and is told to get on the back of the winged horse called the Burak. And this winged horse then flies him from Mecca up to Jerusalem. At Jerusalem, it deposits him on a huge rock from where supposedly Abraham would have sacrificed or tried to sacrifice his son. And from that rock, he then ascends to the seven heavens. When he gets to the seventh heaven, he meets Allah. Allah says that he is to pray 50 times a day. He comes back to the fifth heaven and meets Moses. Moses questions him. What did he say to you? He says, well, he said that I'm supposed to pray 50 times a day. Moses, hey, that's way too many. Go back up and see if you can get it down. So he bounces back and forth between the seventh and the fifth heaven, back and forth, back and forth, between Allah and Moses. And he gets it down from 50 to 45 to 40 to 35 to 15 to 10, down to five prayers. Once he gets it down to five prayers, Moses says, that's enough. Go on back down to earth. So he then re, uh, comes back down to that rock, gets back on the winged horse, the burak, and flies back to Mecca. This is known as the miraj, the miraj. And that's why in 621, all Muslims must pray five times a day because of that event. And that's right there in Jerusalem where the Dome of the Rock is now built today. We're going to talk a lot about the Dome of the Rock uh, later on in this talk. But hold on. This is the narrative that we're getting from the Muslims himself. So that's not the, this is not the place to introduce that. In 622, then, he gets a commission from the Ansar, the, uh, the people who are the natives, the Arabs who are native to Medina. They're having problem with the Jews. They do not get along with the Jews. The Jews are the merchants. They're, they're by far the most wealthy people in Medina. They do not get along, so they go to Muhammad, who is a neutral arbitrator, to come to arbitrate and settle this dispute between the Ansar and the Jews. So he leaves Mecca, and the reason he leaves Mecca is not only because of this invitation. He leaves Mecca because he's not getting along with anybody. And he is receiving this revelation, the Meccan revelation. If you look at the Meccan revelation, you will see that it has an awful lot of injunctions of what to do and what not to do. And the fact that it says to give your life to God, Allah, and to also honor his prophet, Muhammad. And so the Meccans didn't like this. They didn't like him, that he was from a minority family, the Quraysh family, the Quraysh. The Quraysh family were not well known. They were not very wealthy in Mecca. Who is this upstart to make all these claims about himself and about this God? And so, of course, Allah is the name for God. Allah was the name for all the gods there in Arabic, that it was borrowed from the Nabataean god, Ilaha. So the, the Allah is not, the, not that he was introducing a new God. It's just that he was introducing a new revelation, a new pronouncement, and he was at the height of it, of, of that pronouncement. And so he was not at all popular in Mecca. So it was easy for him to leave Mecca, go to Medina, and become a neutral arbitrator. So he was not, he did not have much power in Mecca. So when he left in 622, according to the traditions, now when I say traditions, I mean the Islamic traditions. You'll see what I mean. That's the Siddha, that's the Hadith, that's the Tafsir, and that's the Tahrid, the four. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But those traditions say that he left 
in 622 with maybe 80 followers, some say maybe as much as 200. It was a small group. Whatever the number is, it's a small group, not very many. And so he leaves with these followers. They go up to Medina, and that's in 622. And then from 622 to 632, the last 10 years of his life, he then receives these revelations, which are the Medinan revelations, the first part of the Quran on this side. And these are quite different. When you look at the two halves, you will see the Quran is very different between these two halves. There's not too much here as Christians that we cannot accept. Because this primarily talks about God up here, man down here, and how, how uh, man must obey God, must submit to God. There's not much, there's no violence in this part of the Quran. It's this part of the Quran that has where all the problems are. Here's where all the confrontation against the person of Jesus, it confronts Jesus, his divinity, the Trinity. It confronts everything we know to be important for our doctrines. And this is where the violence can be found. This is much more cultural and it's much more culturally adaptive. And so when he's there from 622 to 632, the last 10 years of his life, he receives those revelations. In 630, <clears throat> he conquers Mecca without firing a shot. There was this agreement of Hudaybiyah, uh, and it's the agreement of Hudaybiyah where he was then given this, uh, you might, he was given, uh, he was given this reference. Uh, it was a treaty between him and the Meccans that he would not convert any new people from Mecca. And so in 630, they allowed him to just walk right into Mecca and take over. So that happened in 630. And then in 632, suddenly he dies. Now, we don't know how he died there. According to the traditions, he died by poisoning. What we do know is that the Quran had not yet been written when he died. It was not in a book form. It was not written down. It had been memorized by many of his companions. It had been written on bone stones and, and pieces of bark, some leaves, but not in a codified form, not in a book form. That's what we do know in 632. Abu Bakr then becomes the caliph, uh, and he is the one that commissions Zaid ibn Thabit to write the Quran the first time. Abu Bakr then dies in 634. That recension that he commissioned Zaid ibn Thabit to do, he gave to Umar's daughter. Uh, her name was Hafsa. Umar becomes the next caliph in 634 to 644. Hafsa takes that Quran and puts it under her bed and leaves it there for 20 years. So Umar is the second caliph. He is killed in 644, and Uthman then takes over. Uthman then rules from 644 to 656. It's during his reign in 652 that the Quran is written a second time. That's a second recension. We'll be going into that in another lecture and under, help you understand why the significance of that. So the Quran that I have in my hand today is not from Abu Bakr. It is from Uthman from 652, according to all Muslims that I speak to. We're going to def destroy that in a few weeks when we confront the Quran historically. But that happens under Uthman. He then is killed in 656, and Ali, the adopted son of Muhammad, supposed to be the legitimate heir, should have been the one who took over power before Abu Bakr. He then becomes caliph in 656. He only lasts five years. He then is killed at the Battle of Sifin by Muawiyah. So that's the classical account. Have any of you heard of any other account? Have you heard? Now, I'm not giving you exhaustive. I'm just giving you the skeletal, just the skeleton. But that's the account that all of us have heard. Muhammad was born in 570 in Medina. I'm sorry, in Mecca. Uh, moves uh, from, starts receiving revelation in 610. Moves from Mecca to Medina in 622. Uh, conquers Mecca in 630. Dies in 632. And then you have Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali, the four rightly guided caliphs known as the Rashidun period, the golden period of Islam. That takes place uh, between 624 and 661. So that 40-year period is known as the golden era. That's it. That's the classical account. That's what we've all believed. That's what I believe. That's all I've been taught. That's all you've been taught. That's all that anybody's been taught because that's all that we had. We've had no other narrative. We've had no other narrative. But then look, take a look at this. I want to show you this. Look at this timeline. So what I've just been talking about is in that red dotted area on the left. That's the time period that I'm referring to. Actually, that's really the time period I'm referring to up until the death of Muhammad. So that's from 570 to 632. That's the period we're talking about. That's where the classical narrative takes place. But here's the problem. 
Well, let me ask you, wouldn't you like to, uh, or wouldn't you assume that everything I've just spent the last 10 to 15 minutes talking about, about how Islam began, that all that was written down by people who were actually there? Wouldn't you say yes to that? Of course I would. I would expect that whoever wrote the story down about how Islam began, about who Muhammad was, about when he was born, uh, how he received these revelations from 610 to 632, uh, moving from Mecca to Medina, all these stories about him going up to the seven heavens, all these stories about him coming into Mecca, then dying in 632, and then Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali, the four rightly guided caliphs, all these stories about how Islam began, I would assume would have been written by someone from that time period who was actually there. I would like it to be written by someone, wouldn't you? I certainly would, because we're only talking about 1,400 years ago. That's not very long ago. Yet we have nothing at all about this story from that time period. Nobody that we know ever wrote this story down. Everything I've just told you does not come from the time Muhammad lived or the time of Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali. It does not come at all from the seventh century. Nothing was written down about this, all these events from the seventh century. In fact, take a look at the next slide. Look and see when it was first written down. And see where my cursor is? It was first written down here with Ibn Isak. He is the first to write it down. Look at the date, 765. 765, that's the mid-8th century. That's 130 years later. But we have nothing of Ibn Isak's. Nothing exists today. There are no extant copies. That's all been lost. Rather clumsy, don't you think, of losing something that important. So who do we go to? We go to Ibn Hisham, 833, right here. This is the man that takes what he liked of Ibn Ishaq and threw away what he didn't like. So it was really up to, it was very subjective. He threw away much of what Ibn Ishaq wrote and only retained what he really wanted. So he is the one that first writes down the story of Muhammad, Ibn Isham. And look at his dates, 833. Muhammad died in 632. That's 200 years later. Then it's, then it's you have the sayings of Muhammad. They're probably much more uh, much bigger. We've talked about this before. So a lot of this is review for you because we've gone through this with the story of Muhammad. It is Al-Buhari who then writes down the sayings of Muhammad, and he dies in 870. So between 850 and 870, you get the sayings written down. He was given 600,000 of these akhbar, and out of the 600,000, he wills it down, and throws out everything except for 7,397. So basically 7,400 of these sayings. He throws out 98% and on only retains 2%. That's around 870. And then there's others that come after him, other sayings, other groups of same comp compilations. You have the Sahih Muslim, you have Ibn Dawud, you have Tirmidhi. Now you have all these six major compilations, but they all come after Al-Bahari, after 870. And then we have the last genre are known as the Tafsir and the Tahrik, and they are all written down by this man here, Al-Tabari. He's the first to write them down. And look at his date, the 923. So everything we know about what happened here in this era, era from 570 to 632, does not get written down until this era from the 9th and 10th century. Everything we know about in the 7th century doesn't get written down till the 9th and 10th century. There you can see the dates in the, of the classical account, Ibn Isak, 765. We don't have his manuscripts. We don't even know if what he said is what he said. We have no idea since nothing has been retained. Ibn Isham, 833. Al-Buhari, 870. Al-Tabari, 923. Now, I, I, I wonder, does that bother any of you? That bothers me enormously. Because if everything we know that happens in the 7th century is not written to the 9th and 10th century, two to 300 years later, how can you trust any of it? Nothing is written down in that intervening period. Everything they know and everything they write about, they get from a list of names of so-and-so who got it from so-and-so who got it from so-and-so who got it from one of the companions of the prophet. That's all oral tradition. It's nothing more than like Chinese whisper, whispers that you play in a, in a birthday party or telephone or whatever the name you want to give to it. But that is not something that I would trust. And that's why when you look at the person of Jesus Christ, look at Christianity. Now, let's do a comparison. We know that 
the writings of Paul start to be get, start to reappear in uh, within 15 years of his death. Within 15 years, up until 62 AD, Paul was writing his letters, uh, and these were sent to the different churches. We know that the gospel account, three of the gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, were written by 60 AD. So within 40 years of Christ's death, you have three of the gospels. The, the gospel of John was written much later, around 90 AD. So everything we know in the New Testament about who Jesus was, what he did, and what he said, were written between 15, yeah, between 15 to 60 years after his death. Whereas everything we know about Muhammad, who he was, what he did, and what he said, is written to two to three hundred years after his death. Which is more authoritative? Well, you can see the answer to that would be what we know of Jesus is much more authoritative because it's much earlier. It's much closer to the event. And it was written by eyewitnesses. Matthew and John were eyewitness to everything they saw. Everything they wrote, they saw. They were with him for three years. So they knew exactly who Jesus was, and they knew what he did, and they knew where he went, and they knew what he said. The others who wrote down about Muhammad were not eyewitnesses. Remember, of the, other four, of the four gospel accounts we have, two were eyewitnesses and two were not eyewitnesses, but they got it from the eyewitnesses. Whereas in Islam, everything we know about Muhammad, everything we know about how Islam began, were not from any eyewitnesses. None of them lived anywhere near there. They lived hundreds of years later, and they lived hundreds of miles away. Bukhara, from Bukharistan. Tabari, from Al-Tabari. Al-Tabaristan. These are hundreds of miles. These are up in near Uzbekistan, near north of Iraq and Iran. Hundreds of miles away, hundreds of miles, uh, hundreds of miles away and hundreds of years distance. So you can see the problem we're dealing with, or not we are, the problem Islam is dealing with. As a comparison, if we had to depend on sources for our Lord Jesus Christ, comparable to those Muslims have for Muhammad, Jesus would not begin to appear in any written form until the third century. There would be nothing written about him until the early third century. Can you see the difficulty we're talking about? And this is why we, when we talk about historical tradition, we've got to look at these problems. This is the concern of the scholars themselves. So in the 21st century, these are the scholars' concerns. Concerning these late dates, Islam, as we know it, did not exist in the 7th century, but evolved over a period of two to 300 years. That's according to Humphreys. Ripon, Lester, and Wandsworth say the Quran probably was not even revealed to one man in 22 years, but likely evolved over a period of 50 to 100 years. And the conclusion is, according to Cook and Robinson, that the history of Islam, at least from the time of Caliph Abdul Malik, hold on to that name, we're going to talk quite a bit about him tonight, he lay ruled from 685 to 705 and before is a later fabrication. And that's the premise we're going to start this whole lecture with. So I've given you the introduction. That's what we're going to look at. How can we prove that this is a later fabrication? Well, walk with me. Bear with me for the next uh, hour or so. Let's go ahead. We're going to have a break so you can have time to go get your tea and coffee. But let's go through and let's walk through this together and let's see what we come up with. So let's go ahead and continue. What are their concerns? What are the scholars' concerns? Well, here it is. If so much of Islam's history was created so late, then number one, why did it take so long to write it down? Why didn't they write it down immediately? They had scribes at that time. They were literate. Remember, by the time that, um, by the time 642, this is, uh, this is within just 10 years of Muhammad's death, the Muslims, if they were called Muslims, controlled Basra, Baghdad, Damascus, Jerusalem, Cairo. And then by the time Abdul Malik comes to power, they controlled Basra, Baghdad, Damascus, Jerusalem, Cairo, Alexandria, Nish, uh, uh, Herat, Nishapur, and also Aden. These are the major cities of that time. And which means that from <clears throat> by the time that Abdul Malik comes to power, they control from Spain in the west all the way to those from your side, Spain in the West, all the way to uh, India. In fact, where you're from, where you're all, where I'm talking to you right now. So from Spain to India, that whole swath of land was under their control. In fact, I'm left, I would say this is even before, from 30 years prior to that, from 661, Spain to India was under the control. Are you telling me between Spain and India, no one could read? No one could write? 
Nobody in these cities that I've just named, nobody could read and write in those cities? Please. We know that there was a, a library in Alexandria in the 5th century that got burned down. They could read and write, so certainly by the 7th century, they should have had all kinds of libraries all over that part of the world. And somebody could have written this down, the biography of Muhammad and what happened there in the history of Islam. And those that finally did write it down, where did they get it from? Well, as I said earlier, they got it from oral tradition. Everything was done orally. Now, what happens with oral tradition? It gets embellished. It gets deleted. It gets accreted. It gets changed and corrupted. And so that's why I don't trust oral tradition. I'm sure you don't trust oral tradition. No one should really trust oral tradition. And instead of going back to these later traditions, shouldn't we better go back to the seventh century itself? Shouldn't we go back to the seventh century? I think so. We should go back to the seventh century. And that's what we're going to do now. We need to go back to the seventh century and we need to find what actually happened. And that's why we then need to go to this. Take a look at this map. So look at the um, brown area is the, the brown area is the amount of land that was controlled at the time of Muhammad. By the time 632 and he died, that's how much the Arabs controlled. You notice I'm not using the word Muslim. I'm now using the word Arab. You'll see why. So the Arabs controlled that part of the world, just that brown area. By the time that the, the um, uh, by the time that Muhammad had died and, uh, uh, now, 10 years after his death, they then um, controlled the, the light uh, orange or the, uh, the, I'm not sure what color you'd call that, uh, kind of reddish brown. That's the area you can see that's here. And that includes Baghdad, Basra, Jerusalem, and also Cairo and down to Aden in the south. Then by the time of the Mu'awiyah, so now we've ended by the, by the time of the end of the rightly guided caliph, the Rashidun period, they owned all the land from Tripoli in the west all the way to the borders of India in the east, including Pakistan and Afghanistan. So that's a huge swath of land. And this is the area, this is the area that we're going to talk about the most. So by 661, they owned all of the reddish brown and the reddish uh, and the pink area and the brown area. All right. Keep that in mind as we continue on now. So here is the historic critique that I'm going to induce tonight. And the scholars that I use to get to the conclusions that I've come to are listed there on your screen. Dr. John Wandsborough, head of department at School of Oriental and African Studies in the University of London, wrote two books in the 1970s called Quranic Studies and another one called Sectarian Milieu. These are the two books that just destroyed everything. These are the first two. Well, then everything. Sorry, that's not, I'm getting a little bit hyperbole there. These are the ones that started the ball going. And these are the ones that are considered to be the classic of the books that created the whole problem of what we know today as revisionism, revising the history. Because they asked the right questions. They asked the same questions of Islam uh, that, that Wellhausen was asking of Christianity back in the 1800s. Dr. John Wandsborough got a death threat for writing these books. He then had to stop all that he was doing and he moved to France and he stopped and he just looked at trade law for the rest of his career. Dr. Gerald Haunting was the man I studied under when I was at SOAS. I studied there at SOAS as a, an, an occasional student back in the 1990s, 93, 94 and 95. And while I was studying under John Hotting, I'd already had my degree in Islamics by that time. I wasn't getting a degree there, so as I didn't need to, I already had a master's in Islamics. But he was the one that introduced me to John Wandsborough's material, and he started to introduce me to other people like Patricia Krona, uh, who is the next in line, and uh, Dr. Andrew Rippin, who's coming after him, and Dr. Robert Hoyland, who comes down after him, and Yehuda Neville, all of these Orientalists, these scholars of high repute. Gerald Haunting was the first one to introduce this material to me. I remember when I was in his class on this material that I'm going to introduce right now. This was in 1994, so we're talking about 26 years ago I, I've been working on this. 26 years, I remember first hearing about it, and I uh, had never heard any of this when I was at his class. There were 50 students in our class, and within two weeks, all the Muslims, except for two, <clears throat> about 20 of them, left the class. And as they were leaving, they would slam the door and yell something really um, uh, uh, irreparable to Dr. Hawking. It was very difficult because all Dr. Hawking was doing was asking historical questions. And they would not have anything to do with it. 
The only two that remained for the whole class became friends of mine. I actually was able to go through the whole year with them and we engaged back and forth and it was great having them along. One was a convert to Islam. I don't think he's a convert anymore, primarily because of this material. But he is the one that actually packed it, unpacked it best that I found. Dr. Gerald Hawking, he was head of department at SOAS at that time. He's now retired. But it was the material from Dr. Patricia Corona. Dr. Patricia Corona is a woman. Uh, she is from Denmark. Uh, she studied under Wandsboro, got her doctorate there at SOAS in London. She then went on to Oxford University and wrote a, a book along with Dr. Michael Cook, who is also a co uh, they were both at the university at the same time. They both got their doctorates together. And Dr. Patricia Corona could read and write 15 archaic languages. I don't know how many of you can read and write 15 archaic languages, but this was a real, I mean, this is amazing, her ability. And she was able to go right back to all the original documents and read them in their original, in their original language. And then that's why she was so much, uh, so far ahead of everybody else in the world. Nobody... I don't think has been, has an equal her and will equal her for a long time. So she was at Princeton University, I'm sorry, at, I'm sorry, let me back up. She was at Oxford University when she wrote Hagarism along with Dr. Cook, which is a what if scenario, similar to what I'm doing tonight. And then she wrote a book in 1998 called Mech and Trade in the Rise of Islam, either 1997 or 1998. And it was those two books, especially the Meccan trade, that created a huge havoc amongst the Muslims uh, in the Western world. Because she did what Muslims should have been doing for the last 14 years, and finally she did. She looked at all the original sources in the original languages, and she came up with conclusion after conclusion after conclusion. I was challenged to do a debate in 1995, 25 years ago at Cambridge University. By this time, she had got a she had written this book. She got death threats uh, on uh, the people. Muslims were claiming they were going to kill her for what she had written. She had to leave Oxford and she moved to Cambridge. And so it was at Cambridge that I was going to do this, this, this uh, debate with Dr. Jamal Badawi in 1995. And I went up to see her and I spent an, an afternoon with her. And she went through all my notes and she said, well, that's a good idea. Here's a better idea. Here's a better way to put it. Why don't you put this in? And so she basically created my notes for my debate that I was going to have with Dr. Jamal Badawi the next week. And we had the debate. And at that debate, she didn't, I said to her, why don't you do this debate? You know this material a lot better than I do. She says, I cannot do what you're doing. I don't have the freedom to do what you're doing today. And I realized what she was talking about many years later, not at that time. But the debate I did in 1995 was really much of the material that I'm introducing to you today. So this is something I've been working at for 25 years. And it's part of my doctoral thesis. But she was the one that actually came up with many of the major ideas, the most devastating ideas, especially on the city of Mecca. We're going to get into that later on. Now, she uh, then finally moved from Cambridge University and moved to Princeton University, where she and Dr. Cook were head of department. And I don't think anybody has equaled what she has done. She was way ahead of everybody. She just died two years ago. Uh, we lost her from cancer. Dr. Andrew Rippin from Calgary, he is the one that has taken this very difficult technical material. When, when Dr. Patricia Crone or others write, Dr. John Wansman and others, they would quote all these vast portions of literature, but they would keep it in the original language and they would not translate it. And so it's difficult to read and they didn't want really people to read it. They only want scholars to read it. And that's why they kept it up in those languages. Whereas Dr. Rippon, what he did is he took this material and put it down to layman's terminology so you and I could understand it. And that's why he's so good. Uh, he's from Canada, taught at the University of Calgary. Dr. Robert Hoyland is another one of these geniuses. Uh, he can read and write 18 languages. What a mind. Wouldn't you be able to love to be able to write 18 archaic languages? And he was the one uh, at Oxford University when I was there. Um, sorry, not when I was there. When he was there, I would go and visit him. And he was, uh, when I started my doctoral thesis, both Patricia Corona and Dr. Robert Hoyland were my second supervisors, one after the other. And so there in, uh, at Oxford, he wrote this book here. I think I've got it here. Um, Seeing Islam as Others Saw It. This book that I have in my hand here. This is the book that he wrote. And he was the first one to actually go through all of the 
writings from the 7th and 8th century from the surrounding peoples and write down what they knew about Islam. And that's why this book has been so devastating and many Muslims have tried to uh, refute it. They can't because he just went and used historical criticism, the very same type of criticism we're using tonight. Dr. Yehuda Nebo was from Jerusalem, uh, from Israel. He was at University of Jerusalem. He was the first to go and actually look at the inscriptions, all the inscriptions in the Negev Desert, in that area of the world. And he looked at the Arabic inscriptions and he tried to unpack them and make, make sense of them. Uh, so he was the one, the first to do that. And then we have the German school, and that includes Dr. Gunther Luling, Dr. Gerd Quinn, Dr. Von Volkmer, Dr. Oleg. These are all the Germans. They have done the best work on the Quran itself. They're the ones that have gone through all the material. I'll be using their material in a later lecture on the Quran, asking the same questions of the Quran, what we're asking of Islam. But there have been three books and two documentaries which are paving the way. One book, and this is the one that I, I recommend to everybody. It's called In the Shadow of the Sword, written by Dr. Tom Holland. You can see the UK version and the US version. I don't know which version they actually sell there in India, but you can get it on Amazon. Go ahead and pull it down. I think everybody should get this book. He wrote this between 2006 and 2012. I was there when he first started it. I, uh, I was the one that recommended he write this book because he's such a great historian. He has written bestsellers there in Britain, some of the best sellers that are around are his uh, Persian Fire. Um, um, I forget the names of the other best sellers, but he's uh, it was he because uh, he wrote about the Byzantine world, he wrote about the Roman world, and he also wrote about the Sassanians. Persian Fire would be the Sassanian world. He was the one that was best, I thought, fitted to write the next chapter. And I asked him about this uh, back in 2006, if he would go to the next chapter, which I said to him, I remember saying, you know, now you've written about the Byzantines and the Romans, and you've written about the Persians, why don't you write who comes next? And he says, well, that's the Islam, right? I said, yes, why don't you do that? She said, oh, that'll be fun. He normally writes a book in every three years, but this book took six years. And the reason why is because there's no source. There's nothing from the 7th and 8th century that he went, could go to to find out about Islam. And that's what he's done with this book. He pretty much unpacks what he could get, and he bemoans the fact that there's nothing there that he could put his, put his pen into. And so that's why he starts from this premise that if we have a religion that's based on material that's two to 300 years later, that should be a problem. So let's go back to the 7th century, read that book, and enjoy it, unpack it. He then did a, a documentary, um, an, about an hour-long documentary uh, that he introduced in 2012, in August 28th of 2012, called Islam, the Untold Story. Put it up on Channel 4 television there in United Kingdom. I was there and I watched it uh, August 28th. And it really what it does is he takes everything that was in that book that was salient and he puts it and brings it into just an hour, maybe it's an hour and a half. Now, he didn't come to any conclusions. He was very careful not to come to any conclusions because he did not want to hurt the sensibilities of Muslims. And so he would take a scholar uh, from Georgetown University, a Muslim scholar with him, and he would say, well, here's what I found. What do you think? Here's what I found. What do you think? He would ask him his opinion. And of course, after a while, this scholar kept all he could say was, well, who cares? We, we have 1.8 billion Muslims. Uh, they believe in this. So therefore, that's important. You can see he had no response. He had no retort. It was much like Dr. Jamal Badawi when I introduced 10 historical challenges at my debate in 1995. He had no response to any of these 10 challenges because he never heard them before. This is all brand new to him. He never ever come to Islam from a historical standpoint, never looked and asked these kinds of questions because Muslims don't want to ask these kinds of questions. They don't like this kind of material. They don't think it's relevant. They think that historical criticism is only for Christianity and for the person of Jesus Christ, not for Muhammad and certainly not for Islam. So you'll see that if you get a chance, watch Islam, the Untold Story. It's up on YouTube. You can pull it down. What was fascinating is they wanted to re-show this uh, hour, hour and a half documentary that winter in December. They're on Channel 4. There was such a backlash from the Muslims there in Britain that they couldn't even show it a second time due to this outside pressure from the Muslims there. And I could not get over that. Why was Channel 4 kowtowing, or not kowtowing, bowing to the pressure of these Muslims when there's nothing really in Islam, the untold story, 
that was derogatory. It was asking the right questions. It was asking historical questions, the very kind of questions we should be asking of any religion, not just Islam, not just Christianity. We should be asking this of the Bhagavad Gita and the Upanishads, the Vedas. We should be asking this of the Granth Sahib from the, from the Sudarjis. We should be asking any re revelation that is there about uh, any religion. We should ask this historical these historical questions. And yet they wouldn't let them show this a second time on Channel 4 television. But the book I want to, I mean, the man that I want to use for an awful lot of my material today is this man here, Dan Gibson. <clears throat> Dan Gibson has written a number of books. This is the Nabataeans. You can see it on your screen there. Uh, this is the precursor. He wrote this actually for the, the government there in uh, Jordan. They commissioned him to write this book, the Nabataeans, Builders of Petra. And this is a book that it does is a precursor to everything we're going to be doing tonight. He then wrote this book here. The Quranic Geography. Quranic Geography is, uh, it's a tome, and he wrote this in 2011. And this one really unpacks an awful lot of the geographical problems with the Quran. We'll say a little bit more about that later. And then he did The Sacred City, which is a documentary, which I think you have in Hindi. In fact, I think the Hindi version, the uh, Hindustani version is the most popular. I think over a million people there in India have watched it. So if you have a chance, go up to Dan Gibson's YouTube site. Just go onto YouTube, put Dan Gibson, and then you will go right to his site and then scroll down through the different videos until you get to the Hindi one and uh, watch it. It's about an hour to two. I can't remember if it's an hour or two hours long, but it takes an awful lot, which is uh, that material that's in this book, and it unpacks it for you in a documentary form. That became so controversial and so outspoken that he finally had to writ, write this book, The Early Islamic Qiblas, which he wrote in 2017, so just three years ago. And this is the, uh, the book that really unpacks. It's got lots of color. It's really a very well-written book. It's got graphs, color. It's got pictures. It's got a lot of history. It's very easy reading. And this is the book that just came out three years ago of which I'm going to be using an awful lot in tonight, an awful lot of his material from that book I'm going to be introducing tonight because of its importance. Dan Gibson uh, is a Canadian. Uh, he is uh, an archaeologist. His father was an archaeologist. His grandfather was an archaeologist. And he spent from 19, I want to say 79, till 2005, so 25 years, 2004, sorry, that's 25 years. He spent in the Middle East, he spent amongst the Bedouins. He went from place to place to place to place and he learned the language, came alongside the Bedouins and he went to all these mosques, uh, early Islamic Qiblas, to find the Qibla. The Qibla is the direction of prayer. And he wanted to go to all these different mosques and find where the Qibla was. He is the only one to have done this. He is the first in the world to have done this. Nobody has ever gone and did what he did. And he went to these mosques because he was noticing that almost all the mosques he went to, and he went to over 100 mosques, they were not facing Mecca. Yet they should be facing Mecca because, as we well know, Mecca became the, the, uh, the Qibla was canonized in Mecca, according to chapter 2, one, uh, verse 145 to 149 in the Quran, after Muhammad came back from Medina, uh, uh, when Muhammad was in Medina, and he could not get a he could not get a relationship with the Jews. They refused him. So finally, he gets this revelation in uh, six twenty four. He gets this revelation that the Qibla is supposed to change from Jerusalem back down to Mecca. So every mosque should be facing Mecca from six twenty four. That's what the Quran says. But he noticed that these mosques were not facing at all Mecca. None of them were. Not the ones he was looking at. We'll see why after the break. So then he then uh, put start putting up videos on YouTube. There you can get uh, talking with Dan Gibson. Go and look at those YouTube videos and unpack. There, there's lots up there, and he keeps putting up new ones uh, because this is still ongoing research. He's not stopping. He's still continuing with his research on these kiblas. But he's the one that I'll be using most. 
Now, I'm going to start, before we stop with her break, I'm going to start with their findings. I'm going to start with their conclusions before I prove their conclusions. So here are their findings. This is the findings of the scholars. First and foremost, what they have found is that the first Arab inscription referencing Muhammad is not dated till 691. Remember, Muhammad died in 632. So for 60 years, none of these Arabs knew who this man was. They were not referencing him. Others outside of the Arab world were referencing him. We'll talk about that, but not any Arabs. Oh, and that's why I'm using the word Arabs and not Muslims. So no reference to him until 690. There's no reference to people called Muslims until the 690s. So what did these people who were going to Basra, Baghdad, Damascus, Jerusalem, and Cairo, who were conquering these great cities, who came conquered right after Muhammad died in 632, what did they call themselves? They called themselves Saracens, which is the name for the Arabs of that world. They called themselves Hagarins because they saw themselves in the line of Hagar to Ishmael on up today. So from Abraham through Hagar to Ishmael. They start, that's why they call themselves Ishmaelites because they are in the line of Ishmael. They use the term Maghre because they are from the Maghreb. And they use the term Mahajurun. Hajur, Mahajurun means people of the Hijab, people of the Exodus, people who are nomadic. So these are the names they gave themselves. There's no reference until the 690s for the word Muslim. Nor is there any reference for the word Islam. This is first introduced on the Dome of the Rock in 691. So we have no reference to people called Muslims, no reference to religion called Islam until 691. And most troubling, there's no reference to a city called Mecca until 741. Ooh, two, 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 two. 741. Remember, Muhammad was born in Mecca, according to the traditions, in 570. Lived in Mecca until 622. So this is over 100 years later, 741, that we get the first reference of this city in any inscription. And this has been found by Dr. Patricia Krone and Dr. Robert Hoyland. And the first biography, as I said earlier, of Muhammad is, does not appear until 833. So looking at their conclusions, how are we going to come? How are we and ourselves going to come to a conclusion? Well, we're going to stop there for a break now. We're going to come back. Uh, we're going to take a break for about five to ten minutes. So go and get your coffee. Go and get your tea. Go get something to eat. Stretch yourself. Then come on back. And in about five or ten minutes, uh, we'll go ahead and start again. All right. Until then, this is Jay. Over and out. Let's go ahead and get back into our talk again. And let's continue from where we left off. And uh, let me go ahead and share the screen with you so you can see what we're talking about. There we are. So these are the scholars' findings. <clears throat> and we've gone through these. These are the area that they are I'm giving their conclusions before I then prove what they're saying. So let's go and see what the, how is it they came to the conclusions. And let's start with the first problem. And the first problem has to do with geography. And here's the book that Dan Gibson wrote on this. Uh, he found that when you look at the Quran, when you look at the Quran, there are 65 geographical locations, references that are referred to. <clears throat> Only nine places are named in the Quran itself. Over and over again, it kept on talking about referring to these people from Ud. And it mentions that this prophet... Now remember, in the Quran, though it mentions the prophet's name right through the, I'm sorry, the prophet, the, the, not, sorry, let, me, let me back up. It mentions the prophet over and over again. It doesn't give him a name except for four times. Muhammad's name is only found four times in the Quran. And if you have a pencil, I'll tell you where you can find them. Uh, in chapter 3, verse 144, in chapter 33, verse 40, in chapter 47, verse 2, and in chapter 48, verse 29. So that's chapter 3, verse 144, uh, chapter 33, verse 42, chapter 47, verse 2, and chapter 48, verse 29. Those are the only four places you'll find Muhammad's name, which is curious because you'll find Jesus' name 93 times. It's fascinating that if the Quran only refers to him four times, Mary's name is found many more times. So is Abraham's. All the other prophets, not all, but most of the prophets are found more than Muhammad. And that's curious because if this book is about or for Muhammad, if he received it and refers to 
that he is the arbiter between man and God, and he is the one that receives the revelation, why is it he referred to more than four times? Oh, they talks about this prophet and talks about this Nabi, this Rasul, who lives in a place of the Nabi, the settlement of the Nabi or the prophet. But it only mentions that place where it is, Mecca, once. Chapter 48, verse 24. What it does say is that this prophet has contact with these people from Ad. 23 times he has contact with these people from Ad. What is Ad? Ad would be the biblical Uz. So we know about Ad. We know about the people of, of Uz or Uz. 24 times he has contact with these people from Thamud. That would be the Nabataeans. The Nabataeans that Dan Gibson wrote this book about, the Nabataeans. So these people from Nabatea, here, the Nabataeans, they are well known. We're going to talk more about them. They're exciting people. Seven times he talks about, about these people from Midian. Midian, we know about the Midianites. So the people from us, the Nabataeans and the Midianites, we know about. They're in the Bible. The problem is, take a look on the map on the right and you'll see where they are. They're way up north. They're way up 600 miles further north. Then Mecca, Mecca is right at the bottom of the map. So if he was having contact, all this contact, this prophet was having this contact with these people from Ad Tamud in Midian, he's way down in the south. He, but how would he get up 600 miles to meet them and come back down in the same day unless he had a helicopter? They didn't have helicopters that I'm aware of back in the seventh century. So you can see the problem here. None of these people are near Mecca. None of these people are near the Hijaz where he lived. None of these people are near him. They're 600 miles too far north. And that's the difficulty right there. Gibson found that out. And he said, this has got a problem. We've got to unpack this. We've got to see why. When you do a comparison between the Quran and the geographical allocation of the Quran and just the Gospel of Luke, take a look at the Gospel of Luke and do this uh, parallels back and forth. And you will see that there are no parallels in the gospel in the Quran. There are 65 geographical references in the gospel of Luke. There are 110, many more in the gospel of Luke. What's fascinating of the 65 geographical references, uh, references and the nine places named, none of them fit where Mecca is. They're 600 miles too far north. They're all in the wrong place. When you look at the 110 geographical references in the gospel of Luke, 31 places are named, not just nine, 31 are named. They're all in the right place. They all belong. So it, it, just doing this comparison, you can see with the Gospel of Luke, we've got the right man doing the right thing, doing the right time in the right place. Not the case with the Quran. Wrong man doing the wrong thing at the wrong time in the wrong place. And that's the difficulty that, that he found with the Quran. He wanted to find Mecca. And the problem is it's only referred to once in the Quran, chapter 48, verse 24, and it doesn't say much. It just says, and he it is who hath withheld men's hands from you and hath withheld your hands from them in the valley of Mecca after he had made you victors over them. Allah is seer of what you do. So we do know that this place is in a valley. <clears throat> Behold, the first temple ever set up by mankind was indeed the one at Bakka, rich in blessing and a source of guidance. Uh, unto all the world. That's in chapter 3, verse 96. So is this Mecca or is this Bakka? Could it be the same place? It has a different, it has a different spelling. It has different cases. But nonetheless, people have wondered. What we do know is, according to Islam itself, according to traditions, these are much later traditions now. Remember, these are the 9th and 10th century traditions, that the and also I'm sorry, this is the, um, this is just the Quran. We're looking at the Quran right now. Let's see what the Quran says, not the traditions. When you look at the Quran itself in chapter three, verse ninety six, it's the first sanctuary appointed to mankind. Whether if you take and you use Bakka as Mecca, it is the mother of all settlements, according to Surah six ninety two and chapter forty two, verse seven. Nowhere does it say Mecca is. It just says this place of the Prophet is the mother of all settlements. According to chapter 7, verse 24, Adam and Eve are thrown out of the Garden of Eden. We don't know where they're thrown to. We have to go to the traditions. In the tradition, it says that they're thrown, Adam was thrown to India in Kerala, and Eve was thrown to Mecca. So she is thrown down to Mecca. He, Adam then gets up and strides across, right across India, right up over through Afghanistan, over all the way over to the Middle East, and arrives in Mecca to join Eve after they're thrown out of the Garden of Eden. 
according to chapter 21, verse 51 to 71, Abraham comes down. Now, it doesn't say Mecca in the verse. It just says he comes down and he goes into the Kaaba. So the Kaaba is referred to, but then remember, there are many Kaabas. Every town has a Kaaba. Every major city in the Middle East at that time had Kaabas. Nonetheless, he goes into the Kaaba and destroys the idols. And that's in chapter 21. So certainly what we're seeing here is that this city of the prophet was at the very beginning with Adam and Eve. This city of the prophet was also there at the time of Abraham. That's 1800 BC, 1900 BC, excuse me, not 1800. And according to, <clears throat> it's inferred that Muhammad lived there, was born there, grew up there. So that would be between 570 and 622. And that the Qibla was canonized, was changed down to this place in chapter 2, verse 149 to 150. Though it doesn't say the word Mecca, it just says from to the place of the, uh, of the, from, the, from Jerusalem down to the great mosque. That's in chapter 2, verse 149 to 150. And the word Qibla is there. So only one reference to Mecca in the entire Quran, chapter 48, verse 24, but reference after reference after reference that this was this place, whatever this place is called, whether, it, but the place of the prophet where he was born and grew up, that this existed from the time of Adam and Eve. So it's the oldest city in the history of mankind, if those are all correct. What we do also know about this place where the prophet lived, now here we're going to go to the traditions. And when you go to the traditions, it is referred to as Mecca, because these traditions are now from the 9th and 10th century. So way back in the 9th and 10th century, we start to see reference after reference about this city. That it's in a valley, in a parallel valley. We see that in Ibn Isaac and Al-Buhari. Uh, that it's in a, that has a stream going through it. Uh, we see that in Al-Buhari. That it's outside it are ruins and a pillar of salt where the wife of Lot was turned into salt. We see that in Surah uh, 37 of the Quran. That it has fields. Al-Buhari talks about that. That it has trees, grass, fruit, clay, loam. We find that in Al-Timiri, Al-Buhari. We also find that in Al-Tabari. And it also in chapter 6, uh, um, Surah 6, 141, it says, and also Surah 16, and I also Surah 80, it has olive trees. Olive trees. Now that's interesting because that's very specific. And then it has mountains overlooking the Kaaba. Ibn Isaac talks about that, Al Buhari. When I say Ibn Isaac, that should be Ibn Isham. So you can see that all the traditions do refer to a place that's in a valley, that has a stream, it has ruins, it has outside of it, it's in a, it has fields with trees, grass, fruit, clay, loam, and also olive trees. It's a very a verdant place, mountains overlooking the Kaaba. But none of that makes sense for Mecca. None of that makes sense for Mecca. Mecca is not in a valley. It has none of those items listed above. It is much more too arid and much too dry to accommodate any of that. So this cannot be Mecca is referring to all these places. Now, when you look at maps, look at this trade map. This is just a facsimile of a trade map from that time period. Uh, take a look where all the trade routes go in the green arrows and notice where the question mark is, the red question mark. That's where Mecca should be. It's not on the trade route anywhere. You can see here the trade routes, uh, another uh, map of the trade routes at that time. Do you notice Mecca's not on that trade route? Medina is. Medina was called Yathrib at that time. It wasn't called Medina. It's not called Medina now. It just means city. Yathrib was the name. Najran, Toma, Marib, all those are on the trade route. But what happened to Mecca? It's not there. Now, here are some actual maps. This is an actual map from the 6th century. Mecca should be where that red question mark is. It's not there. Here's another map. This is a 7th century map. You notice Mecca's missing there as well. It should be where that question mark is. Where's Mecca? No one seemed to know what this place was. And these are maps. Look at all the other cities that are there. All the other towns and hamlets and all the other oases are, are on that map, but not Mecca. Missing completely. Still missing on another map. Here's another 7th century map. You can't find Mecca on this 7th century map. Yet, it's supposed to be the time, uh, go all the way back to Adam and Eve, where Abraham came from, where Muhammad was born and grew up. Here's another 7th century map. Mecca's missing again. So in every map that we can look at from the 7th up until the 7th and 8th century, we can't find Mecca anywhere. Now, I want to talk about what we do know about Mecca from what the Orientalists say. And 
here's the problem. All the all that the Orientalists had were the traditions. So the Orientalists would go back to these traditions that I talked about earlier in my talk, and they would go back and try to piece together everything we do know about how who at Mecca was and how Mecca became famous. And probably the most important famous of these theories is what we know as the trade route theory that was put out by Dr. Montgomery Watt in the last century. And he started from this premise. Now here's just the map. This is a map done today, looking back at what we think the seventh century looked like. And on this map, you'll see Mecca is there, but this is what we today, this is what the Orientalists today always, and all the Islamic scholars today would have thought the world would look like in the seventh century. And Montgomery Watt talks about that the trade came from the China and also from India and went across where that black arrow is, went across the Arabian Sea over into the Persian Gulf. And then from the Persian Gulf, it went up over across uh, what was then, uh, what is today Jordan and Syria and Israel and went over to the Mediterranean because it needed to get to the European world, needed to get to the Mediterranean world. And that's where the trade was went. Uh, it went through that route that you see there, following those black arrows. That's where all the trade went. And that's true. The trade did go through there. But then he said that there were two great kingdoms, the Byzantine kingdom, which is in the west there, and the Sassanian, which would be the Persians. So the Persians, the Sassanians, they are what is today Iran and Iraq. And the Byzantines, uh, that's Turkey there, they were the Christians, and they controlled all the eastern coast of the Mediterranean. So they, their kingdom came down right along the coast of the Mediterranean, all the way down to Egypt. And these two great kingdoms were at war with each other from the 5th, 6th, and 7th century. So because they were at war with each other, that shut the trade going down through the Persian Gulf. It could no longer go that route because there was too much warfare there and it's too dangerous. So the trade was shut down, he said, and it had to be redirected. And it got redirected this way, across the Arabian Sea, over to Aden, down here. Aden, that I see that you have circled there. See it there? That is still there today. Aden, what is in today? Yemen. And then what Montgomery Watts said was that the trade went across the Western Plateau all the way up to the Eastern Mediterranean, going from Najran to Sana to Taif. And then he said down to Mecca, up to Yathrib, then up to and let's just look at a map and see that. So he said it started Aden and went up to Taif, going to Najar and Sana. And then from there, it uh, Taif, it would jog down to Mecca down here. And then it would jog back up again to get to Yathrib. Because you can see there is a plateau there. Can you see the plateau on the map? So the trade route followed that plateau. But at Taif, it took a diversion off the plateau down to Mecca. Mecca is not on the plateau. Mecca is not on the sea as well. It's inland about 50 miles, but it's down off the plateau. There Mecca got rich because of the trade. And then the, the trade caravans would then come back up the plateau about a thousand meters up to get to Yathrib. Miles, I'm sorry, but a thousand meters up in elevation. And then from Yathrib, they would go on up to Gaza there in the north. So from Aden to Gaza, it would go that 1,250 miles uh, coming down to Mecca and back up to Yathrib. Now, this was his trade route theory. Dr. Patricia Krona, who I mentioned earlier, she looked at this trade route theory and she saw there was a problem. First problem, she said, why in the world do you have that diversion coming down to Mecca? Why would you come down off the plateau? Why would you go down to a place called Mecca that had no water, had no ver uh, fields, had no way to accommodate these caravans, had no food to accommodate these caravans? And why in the world would you go down there to get back up again? Why wouldn't you just stay on the Western Plateau? Why would you come a thousand meters off and come and go back a thousand meters up? She saw that very clearly. So she started questioning Montgomery Walk's trade route theory. No one had really questioned this before. No one had bothered to look at any map. Let's go back to the theory again. So what Montgomery Watts said is, well, that's what he thought. So when she questioned this, no one really knew how to respond to this. What's more, let's go back here again. She questioned this as well. She said, look at this map here. If it comes across the Arabian Sea over to Aden, why would it go from Aden up across the Western Plateau, up to Gaza in the north? 
when you have a waterway that goes up to the west. Look at the waterway. Do you see the waterway there? She says, it doesn't make sense to be already on sea, coming across the Arabian Sea, and to take all the goods off in Aden and then go up 1,250 miles by land up to Gaza in the north. She said, if you take a ton of goods, which is true, if you take a ton of goods and you take them 50 miles by land, that would cost the same amount as 1,250 miles by sea. It's much cheaper to take goods by sea. That's why even today, all the goods that are coming across the world, when we get all our goods from China, they are not sent by railway or by truck or, or by air. They're all sent by sea. All these huge big containers, that these oil containers, when they're shipping oil all over the world, they're enormous. And the reason is because that's the cheapest way to send any goods. All you need in the old days, before they had engines, they, all you need was the sails and they would, the wind would push them. And that's why all the trade was done by sea. She said, why did they use the Red Sea? So she completely confronted this whole trade route theory, going up through Taif, down to Mecca, up to Yathra, and then on up to Tabuk and Chaibat in the north to get to Gaza. And she said, no, 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 that doesn't make sense. You would not go by land. So she decided that she would do some work on this. And I remember she reads and writes 15 languages. So she went back to all the trading documents there in India, because they are all coming from the Indian uh, coast of India. The trade could not go up over the Hindu Kush. You can see the mountains there, the Himalayas and the Hindu Kush. That stopped the trade from going up north. So they had to come west, and that's why they came off from the western coast of India. And she went to all the trading documents there, and she noticed that she kept on coming across the same names. And what she found is the trade did come across here, across the Arabian Sea, but it did not stop at Aden. It did not stop there at all. It may have stopped there briefly to get supplies, but what it did is went right up the Red Sea. The trade came this direction. It came right up the Red Sea, and the name that comes up over and over in all the trading documents is Agilis, that I have circled there. Agilis is the city that controlled the trade. Agilis is in Africa. That is in what is today Eritrea. Eritrea. And it was the Eritreans, the Ethiopians that controlled the trade. Their names are found in all the trading documents. That it did go maritime. From the 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th, 6th, all the way up to the 7th century, she found no Arab names. And the reason is very simple. Just take a look at Arabia. The Arabs were not really seafarers. They were, they were actually camel herders. They plied the, and they were the Nabataeans. They plied the deserts. They were the only ones that could get across the deserts. And that's why they controlled the land routes. They did not at all like the sea routes. The Eritreans, however, did like the sea routes and they were the one that controlled all the trade. So how could Mecca, therefore, she asked, have become important? How could it become powerful? She looked at all the trading documents from you know, there, and she noticed that the only thing that really went up the western coast or the western plateau was milk and leather, and that the spices that were that many Muslims have said, including Montgomery Watt, who is not a Muslim, but in his trade route theory, uh, he said that all the spices there were 15 spices that were used to enrich Mecca. She went through every one of the spices, traced down all their. Uh, uh, where the spices were found. And she found only two of the spices were even found in Arabia, in the southern part of Arabia, in the Hadramat, in the Yemen, what is today Yemen and Oman today. That's the Hadramat area. You can see at the bottom of the map there, the, to, uh, the bottom part of the Arabian Peninsula. None of the other spices came from Arabia, and certainly not from Mecca, halfway up the continent, or halfway up the, the peninsula. All of it, all the other spices came either from India or China or from Africa. So she completely debunked that. And then she wanted to find out this reference to Mecca. She wanted to find out where is the first reference she could find. The first time she could find this written on any document is from the Apocalypse of Pseudomethodius Continuato Byzantia Arabica, written in 741. Remember, Muhammad died in 632. So this is over 100 years later that this was finally documented in a document, 741. When she looked on the maps, the first map she could find with Mecca on it was not till 900 AD. 900 AD, woo, two, 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 two. Muhammad died in 632. Can you see the problem here? That's 300 years later. It takes, well, almost 300, just under 300 years, almost 300 years to find this place called 
Mecca on any map. Now let's look at modern Mecca today. When you look at modern Mecca, you will see this huge imposing building, the Abraj al Bayt Towers. That's the royal clock tower. Uh, it is at, I don't know if it is, it's still, but uh, when I when last I looked, it was the fourth highest building in the world. And that clock that you see at the top of the clock tower, it's got four faces on it. And when you look at that clock, it is 45 feet across. It's the world's largest clock face. Uh, and it is towers over the Kaaba. There's the Kaaba at the bottom. And there's, see all those buildings that are built around it? Those are all hotels, huge five-star hotels. And if you know look closely, you will see uh, that the style of the clock there, the clock tower, is very similar to Big Ben in London. And according to Muslims, they would uh, what they want to do is they want to replace Gen uh, Greenwich Mean Time with Meccan Mean Time. They want to bring all of the time, all the clocks in the world, to be categorized uh, to start at this clock tower. That's their intention. So hold the space. That may still happen. What's interesting is when you go to what they want to do with Mecca, these are some of the plans that they have with for Mecca in the future. Now, the one on the top left there is where it is right now. And can you see what's going on here? Have you noticed what's happening here? There it looks like they're cementing up everything, aren't they? Isn't it fascinating? When you look at a current day picture, looking from above, you can see the clock tower on the right. But take a look at all those cranes that they're now building around the Kaaba. And you will see the prophet's wife's house has now been cemented over. Uh, where the prophet Muhammad was born and where he grew up has been cemented over. Uh, the, what's fascinating, they seem to be cementing everything up. Why do you think they're cementing everything up? Well, Dan Gibson wanted to know this. And so he went and asked some of the scholars who were coming, who had been in Mecca, the Muslim scholars, he was asking them about what he knew about uh, any artifacts. Because when you build large buildings, and if you look back at this uh, picture here, take a look at uh, the one on the bottom right. They want to build 62 of these large buildings. Do you see the one on the bottom right and the one above it? Those are all the buildings, the two different plans. Now, whenever you build large buildings like that, you have to dig deep into the ground for a foundation. And in any archaic city, any old city, whenever you build large buildings and you dig down to the foundations. The architects love to come because when the architects come, they want to see what you find because as you dig down into the ground, you come across a lot of artifacts, things that have been left behind. And this, this is how you recreate the history of the city. And this has been done with all the ancient cities. If you go into the Middle East, if you go to Syria or Jordan, if you're driving along the highway there and you look to the right and left and you will see the ruins of or mounds. Uh, these are called tells. And if you dig down through the different mounds, the tells, you come across artifacts. You can recreate the whole history of the city by uncovering these artifacts. And the same thing here in Mecca. It's, if it's the oldest city in the history of mankind, it would have a lot of history underground. So they're digging all these foundations and these uh, architects went to find out what they could find. Dan Gibson asked them, well, so what have you found? And their answer is, not a thing. Nothing has been found. Oh, there was, a, they did find the ruins to an old fort, the, an Ottoman fort that was, in fact, where the clock tower is, is exactly where the Ottoman fort used to stand. And they completely destroyed that to build that clock tower and those buildings surrounded, the seven buildings surround it. And that's why Dan realized they're cementing it up for a very good reason. Basically, they have realized the same thing that we're realizing. If there's no history there, that cannot be brought to the world. And so that's why they're cementing it over. So no one can ever discover this. They're trying to hide the evidence. And there's been a huge backlash and outcry from around the Muslim world for what they're doing. But no one really controls it. So that's the problem with Mecca. Let's go then. We've all had pro first problem was with the geography that all the geographical places do not fit Mecca. They all fit much further north, 600 miles further north. And then we get to Mecca itself. We looked at the problem with Mecca. If you don't have Mecca and you don't have the Kaaba there in the seventh century, then what are you going to do with the Qibla? And this is the big problem. 
every Muslim, you know, all over the world, there in India as well, you know that five times a day, in the morning, in the afternoon, and three times in the evening, they have to do their prayers. And they always, always pray towards Mecca, right? Everywhere. They pray towards that building you see there on the upper right-hand corner. That's the Kaaba. That's the Kaaba. Uh, the bottom left-hand corner there, you can see the mosque surrounding the Kaaba. Now, that was a photograph before they built these large buildings. And there you can see thousands, millions of people who come and do their Hajj uh, there in Mecca. Now, today, if you want to find out where the Qibla is, you just you can go to any mosque and there's a niche on the left-hand corner, that left photograph, that's called the Mihrab. That's the niche in the wall that faces always faces Mecca. Uh, you can see, a, uh, when I was in, the last time I was in Malaysia, in Kuala Lumpur, there in my hotel room, there is, there's the Qibla direction uh, on, a, on the wall. They showed me exactly the Qibla direction. So any mu Muslim anywhere can do, go and follow the Qibla. Now today, you just have it on, your, on an app on your uh, smartphone, whether you have an iPhone or Samsung, or whatever, you just get an app down and it tells you at any time, anywhere, where the Qibla is, where Mecca is. So it's very easy to find the Qibla today. In chapter 2, verse 143 to 150, it says very clearly that the direction of the Qibla was changed. Now, most Muslim scholars believe this was in 624, when Muhammad had been in Medina for only two years. But it doesn't really say where it was changed to. It's just saying to the great mosque. Well, where was this great mosque? This uh, Masjid al-Haram, the forbidden mosque. Now, archaeology supports this change. <clears throat> But not from Jerusalem to Mecca, as Muslims suggest, but to someplace much further north and much later. So, where was it? Well, back in 1905, two archaeologists, Dr. Creswell and Dr. Fehervadi, were doing some digging around the oldest mosque. And they were trying to, this is before these places were made illegal. Now, today, you can't go to these mosques and dig. But back then in 1905, they could. <clears throat> they went to three mosques. They were considered three of the oldest mosques at that time. Uh, one was Fustat outside of Cairo, in, uh, which was built in 641, according to tradition. The other two in Iraq, one was in Wasat Mosque, and the other one was the Kufa Mosque, uh, both in Iraq. And so they went and they dug down to the original floor plans of both these mosques. And as they dug down, they came to the Qibla wall. The Qibla wall is easy to find because it's the, always the longest wall. And uh, they looked and they notice that the direction for both the Qibla, all three of the Qibla walls in Fustat and also Wasit and also Kufa, all three of the Qibla walls were not facing Mecca. They should have been, because these are all in the 7th century up until the 8th century, 706. So these should all have been facing, in fact, any mosque should be facing Mecca, right? They were not facing Mecca. The ones, the Wasit Mosque and the Kufa Mosque, there you can see on the map there in Iraq, were facing west. The Fustat Mosque, which is just outside of Cairo, it's a garrison town, it was facing east. So were they facing Jerusalem? In 1905, they thought they must be facing Jerusalem because they didn't have any accurate way to know because they didn't have GPS, they didn't have satellite technology like we have today. So they just guessed that this must be Jerusalem that they were facing. <clears throat> but you can see where Mecca is on the map. They should have been facing straight south. Why in the east were they facing west and why in the west were they facing east? They should have been facing south. And that was their query. And that's all they said. They didn't have any way to, reason to know any difference. Now, in 705, uh, the Christian writer Jacob Edessa refers, and he says to about the Maghreb. These are the Arabs. He says, so from all that it is clear, from all this, it is clear that it is not to the south that the Jews in the Maghreb here, in the regions of Syria, pray, but towards Jerusalem of the Kaaba, the patriarchal places of their races. So it looks like even Jacob of Edessa, writing in 705, believes that they're facing towards Jerusalem. So he saw that this was odd, that they're not facing in 705, or maybe he did see it was odd, because he doesn't question, he doesn't say where they should be, he just says they're facing Jerusalem. That's what Creswell and Fadavadi thought in 1905. So what then were they facing? Well, there is a whole dispute now, and the man who is actually the world authority on this is known as Dr. David King. If you go up on Fander Films, my films, uh, my YouTube channel, I have done, a, I, th I think it's 11 different episodes with Al-Fadi in just the last month. Go up and look, because David King has been very, has been very um, angered 
by Dan Gibson. Dan Gibson is this man you see pictured there. Dan Gibson is the man I introduced earlier. He is the one that wrote uh, the Nabataeans. He also wrote Chronic Geography, and he also wrote that book that you see pictured here that I have in my hand, Early Islamic Qiblas, and this came out in 2017. And he is the one that is actually confronting this notion uh, that all these Qiblas that are not facing Mecca, they're facing all over the place. D David King is the world authority. Dr. David King is the world authority on the Qibla. He did his whole career on it. He's written about it, many books and also articles. He teaches, yeah, taught in Germany for many years. He's British. He's 79 or, or maybe 80 years old now, so he's about ready for retirement, and he is retired, I'm sorry. And so um, he has been given lots of accol accolades as the world authority on the Qibla, and he has always assumed uh, that the Qiblas were all over the place because they didn't have good technology back then. They didn't have good mathematics. And so they didn't know their directions very well. And he's always taken this position. And he says that there are hundreds of different directions that they are. And every one of these directions can be understood. If you look at the solstice lines, if you look at the equinox lines, if you look at the Roman buildings that were there before, the Byzantine buildings, they just destroyed these churches and rebuilt over top of them. And they just use the same direction they were built. Uh, it was because they didn't know how uh, mathematics, they didn't know their directions that well. And so therefore, that's why it explains all these misaligned, misdirected Qiblas. Dan Gibson comes and he decided for uh, to go and look at all these mosques. And I said earlier, he spent 25 years from 1979 to 2004 going to every one of these mosques. And every one of them, he'd take a look at them and he noticed that uh, they were not going in many other directions. Uh, in fact, he noticed that they were actually going in four directions, four succinct directions. Now, what I'm going to do, and I think we're going to stop there today because I see we're almost coming up to two hours, and I would like to have some time of question and answer. Before I get into Dan Gibson's findings, before we get into his mosque, we'll do that for the, in two weeks. We'll continue this because I'm not even halfway through my lecture, and uh, they're having, I, I want to really unpack this really well because there's some other things I want to do to bring into this, and I, I want to go through and talk about the controversy between Dan Gibson. Gibson and David King, because this is brand new. It's only been out for about a year and a half, and you need to be aware of it. There is a huge controversy going on now between the Orientalists on one side, and then Gibson would re represent the Orientalists, I represent the Orientalists, and classical, the classical account, the Muslims on the other. And the Muslims are using people like David King to confront the Orientalists, to confront the revisionists, to confront the uh, Patricia Cronus, and also uh, to, they, to confront the, the Robert Hoylands and the Dan Gibsons and the, uh, all, of the, uh, all the other Wandsboros and all the others who dare to claim that maybe the classical account is an error. But rather than start that and then have to stop halfway through, I'm not going to get into the Kiblas right now. We're just going to introduce it. We're going to stop there. And I'm going to stop sharing the screen. And what I want to do is get, get you ready for what we're going to be doing in two weeks, because in two weeks, then we are going to talk about the Qibla. We're going to talk about exactly why this is, has been so important. And also in two weeks, what I really want to do is I want to go into the whole problem of the difficulty that we're finding with the geography. But let's go ahead and stop the PowerPoint there. And let's go ahead and stop the lecture there. And let's see if you have any questions. I hope you have been writing questions. I see you do have some questions here. And let's end our time for today since we're coming up over an hour and a half now, let's end our last half hour just looking at the questions and trying to unpack them. So as you get questions, write them in the chat area there. You've got the chat area below you. Just write them out and let's go ahead and see what your, what your questions are. And I'll try to answer them. So the first question is, doesn't, this is from Sam Phillip. Doesn't Al-Buhari say that his writings are a compilation of Aisha's statements about Muhammad? Now, <clears throat> Al-Bahari says, yes, his, he, and to be fair, all of these writers, they are compilations. They're writing compilations from many different sources. Now, Buhari doesn't say it's from Aisha. In fact, very few, in fact, Aisha is only has, Aisha is only referred to when it comes to the um, certain verses of the Quran that were changed. We'll be getting into that, what she said when we get into the Quran. What Al-Buhari de does is he is the one that was given about 600,000 of these akhbar, not from Aisha, from many different sources. He doesn't say what the sources are. 
isn't that curious. And he is given the responsibility between 850 and 870 to take all these different akhabat, as they call them, and look at the matans, the, the matan. Matan would be the body of these akhbar. And then looking at the isnads, that would be the list of names. Isnad is known as the list of names from where these, each one of these matans come from, M-A-T-N. And then he was to decide which were authoritative, which were weak, and which were uh, no longer, or were useless. And be doing that, he then whittled it down from 600,000 down to 7,397, or roughly 7,400, just 2%. Now, none of, none of those that I'm aware of are Aisha's, but they are from other scholars. Ibn Sa'd, others of the companions, uh, Zaid ibn Tabid and others. So that we do know. Obviously, those are 240 years after the fact, and that's the problem. 240 is just too long. It's too many years after the fact to be authoritative. But good question. SPS uh, says, oh, I see. He's given up two references where you can get uh, Dan Gibson's YouTube page. There's the reference. Go ahead and do look at his YouTube page. Go through his videos. He's putting a new one up about every month or so, a new video, because he's still coming up with new findings. And it's fascinating. Everything he's finding is consistent. It follows exactly what I've been saying since 1994. When I, I'm sorry, 1995, when I first did my first debate on this material, I also brought this up. Why are all the Qiblas not facing Mecca? At that time in 1995, I didn't know where they were facing because I didn't have Dan Gibson's material. He didn't publish that until 2014, 2011, actually, is when he first uh, came up with this idea that it was facing another direction. You know, so I'm not telling what that other direction is. You're going to have to wait in two weeks. We'll go into that. Some of you already know what I'm talking about because you've seen my videos. But let's go ahead and we'll get into that when we do. I see also uh, you've put up also the untold story, Tom Holland's documentary. Go and watch it. Watch it tomorrow or sometime this week. It'd be good for you to see that material that, uh, that Tom Holland has put up. It's good material. It's important material. And it's also will help you understand what we're going through in this, these le this lecture and the next one that I'll be doing in two weeks. Now, here's a question from SBS. How do we use these maps to argue with a Muslim who may say that they don't believe in all these maps and the research done by people like Dan Gibson, Patricia Corona, Tom Holland to be true? Um, <clears throat> no, very simple. What we have done and what Tom Holland and Dan Gibson and all the others are saying is that if you're going to argue that the traditions are true, if you're going to argue that the Sira, the Hadith, the Tafsir, and the Tahrik are true, that there was a man named Muhammad. He lived in uh, Mecca between 570 and 622, and then moved up to Medina in 622. You're arguing from, from a historical, uh, you're arguing historical content. The Muslim now has to say, prove it. Or we have to say to the Muslim, prove it that he lived between 570 and 622 in the city called Mecca. So if they are making this claim that he did live in that city, but they cannot prove it, then they're arguing from silence, are they not? Because everything they're gonna argue now from here on out is gonna be an argument from silence. That means they can't prove it or disprove it. They can only make that position. We on the other hand can say, listen, we're not arguing from silence because we're actually showing you, and actually the material that I'm putting up on Fander Films, every day now I'm putting up new material, or every other day I'm putting up new material. I'm actually saying, here are the claims you have made. I'm going to debunk every one of them using historical criticism. So all you need to do is to say to these Muslims, listen, you may not trust these maps, then you show us a map from the 7th century. These are all from the 6th and 7th century. I've just shown you about four or five of them on this PowerPoint. These maps are not our maps, but if you can come up with a 6th or 7th century map that shows Mecca on it, if you can show us any reference to the city of Mecca before 741, before the Continua uh, Apocalypse Byzantia, if you can show anything that predates that, that we can look and see that it does predate it, then we'll believe. But to date, here in 2020, April of 2020, no Muslim has been able to show any reference of any city called Mecca until 741. Muhammad died in 632. So if you're going to claim that there was a city called Mecca that Muhammad lived in, 
That is an argument from science, which is the weakest form of argument when you talk about historical criticism. So you put it right back on their map. When they say, you, we've got to prove, no, we don't have to prove it. We don't have to prove a thing. We're not making the claim that Mecca existed. They're making the claim that Mecca existed. They now got to prove that Mecca was there. They're making the claim that Muhammad existed and was a man that received a uh, revelation that lived in Mecca. And then that revelation is called the Quran. They've got to now prove that Muhammad existed. They've now got to prove that he lived in Mecca. They've now got to prove that he received this book called the Quran. They've got to show us that there's a Quran from the seventh century. Show us one Quran, even from the time of Uthman in 652 or afterwards, or even the seventh century. Show us one Quran that exists from the same century he lived. So the onus is now on them. We don't have to prove a thing. All we have to ask them is, Prove it. You prove it. Show me where this material is. Show me where the city is. Show me who this man is. Show me where this book is. Show me anything. All this reference to this emergent, uh, this uh, creation of it of Islam. All these things, these ideas that these mosques are all facing towards Mecca. Show me one mosque in the seventh century that's facing Mecca. What you're going to find is we can't find one mosque until 727. That's ha almost halfway through the 8th century, over 100 years after the Qibla was supposedly canonized towards Mecca. We are, cannot find any mosque for over, over 100 years that's facing Mecca. Ooh, I love that. So it's not on our shoulders anymore, SPS. We just put it right back on their shoulders and say, don't make these claims unless you can prove it. Don't make these claims for Muhammad, for Islam, for the people called Muslims, for the Quran, for the city of Mecca. Don't make any of these claims unless you can prove it. So we've changed the whole tenure. We've changed the whole debate. No longer do we have to prove something. They have to prove something. We are not arguing from silence. They are war arguing from silence. Ooh, it makes my job so much easier. And that's why it's been so much more fun doing this material in the last 10 years than it has in the last 40 years that I've been working with Islam. Anil Kumar, you have this question. Sir, if Dan Gibson was, uh, died in 2000, not died, he didn't die, he's still living. Uh, how can he write the book Early Islamic Qiblas in 2017? Oh, oh, I see what you're saying. From 1979 to 2004 is when he did his research for these books. That's not, he didn't die in 2004. He's still living today. In fact, that's why he's up there putting a new videos up every month. Uh, Dan Gibson is very much alive. But it was those 25 years that he spent in the Middle East, in Jordan, in amongst the Bedouins, learning the language, meeting them, going from place to place to place to place to place. And he was the one that was during those 25 years up to 2004 that he actually went to over 100 mosques. Now, he's still going to mosques today. He just went on a trip earlier this year and had just got back just before the lockdown, he would, because he's found new mosques. People are always finding new mosques. They're telling him, and he's taking off and going to visit these mosques. So he's very much alive. Thank God he's very much alive. <coughs> You're right. He couldn't have written these books if he was dead. That's a very good point. Okay, uh, Ben Hall, please explain us Magre and Mahajarun. Mahagre, Magre is the name for the Maghreb. Maghreb is the northern part of Arabia. They are from that area. That's all that they're saying. What, so you're like, you're from Hindustan. That means you're from India. It just means that where you're from. They, the word Mahajarun, Hijar, Hijar means exodus. Mu means people of, Un means plural. So Muhajarun would be people, plural. It's always masculine plural because whenever you have people in Arabic, you always have to make it masculine. So it's masculine plural, the people of the Hijar, the people of the movement or the people of the exodus. So Hijra, the word Hijra, when Muhammad went from Mecca to Medina, there is the root word. Hijra means exodus or movement and the people who do the movement muhajrun those who do it are the people who are always moving so they're what that's another way for calling nomads and the arabs were nomads the nabataeans were well known as muhajrun these are the people of the movement so according to the islamic tradition when muhammad moved from mecca to medina that movement of taking people up to medina they were called the Mahajirun. That's the name he put to them. He gave that name for them in the Islamic traditions. But it could be anybody that is in movements. But I mean, today, uh, people call themselves the Mahajirun, people who are on movement, people who are on exodus, people who are going from one place to another. Uh, in Kumar, I'm sorry, I thought 99, okay, 2004. Yeah, that's, that's when, uh, yeah, you're, you're seeing that. Ben goes on, what is the main objective of the Kaaba and does it come under 
pantheistic view of understanding. No, the Kaaba is a well-known institute. Uh, uh, it is. It, it used to be temples. It was not mosque. Mosque just means a place where you bow down. But the temples were always had a. Um, the temples were always facing a Kaaba, and so the Kaaba would be the place that you would that you would have your uh, pilgrimages to it would be a sanctuary a kaaba would be the sanctuary where you would always go for pilgrimage but it would always be the place you prayed now the nabataeans always prayed towards their city and i'm going to talk about that in two weeks and the arabs who are the pre who who are the ones the descendants of the nabataeans they are the ones that continued that function and you're going to see that many of these earliest mosques were temples before they were mosques. They were Nabataean temples, but they're all facing the same direction. And they become mosques when Muslims then take on the name Muslim or the name Islam after 690. So from 690 on, they then take on the name Muslim. And then the Muslims now uh, are praying in these mosques towards the Kaaba, the place, the sanctuary. They have to have a sanctuary. We're going to talk more about what that sanctuary is. We're going to talk about the black stone because the sanctuary is always where the black stone is. And the black stone goes all the way back to the third century AD. The black stone is where God's presence is. Wherever the black stone is, God's presence is there. Where is the black stone today? It's in Mecca on the Kaaba on the northeast corner. That's hugely significant. Muslims don't want to talk about that black stone because that's idolatrous. We're going to talk more about that in two weeks and we'll bring that out. But that's the whole premise behind um, uh, the, the Kaaba. Now, Devadas asked this question, bro, you did a great job. Do you have any plans or research in the area of foreign loan words from different geographical locations? I feel, or you may come up with correlation between your current research and loan word theory. If you could explain that a little bit more, what you mean by that, Devadas, can you please uh, just email me? I'll, I'll just write my email here. If you want to email me, write it to this email right here. I'll put it in capital letters. Yeah, there's my email, J Smith. It's just the letter J. Don't put J A Y. It's just J S M I T H at dirkon.co.uk. If you if you can let me know what you're talking about, Devadas, I'm not sure how to answer that question, but I'd be interested in what you mean. If you're talking about loan words in the Quran, yes, there there are many hundreds of loan words in here. Uh, like better, uh, we do know that there are Akkadian words, there's Syriac words, and the name Issa is a Syriac word. We know that there are lots of words like the Sirat, which is the uh, which is Zoroastrian, uh, which would be Sassanian words. Uh, we we have lots of words that are borrowed in, and that's the reason why is much of the Quran is borrowed anyways. Much of the content of the Quran is borrowed, and when you borrow the story, you also borrow the word. That's why the name Allah Allah is a borrowed word. Allah is from Ilaha, from the Nabataean god, and that's why it's fascinating. Allah and Al Uzza and these are the goddesses this is the goddess al uza who's the wife of uh dushara whose name uh generic name is Alat. so that's a borrowed word that's an abatean word so yeah there are many borrowed words from many other languages and that's uh, maybe that's what you're referring to i don't know but if you could email me and just uh support me what you're doing we can have, we can have a discussion on that uh, Sam Phillips, based on Islamic tradition, isn't it true that Mecca presented uh, a active populated town that Muhammad fought against based on that information? Can we confidently jump to conclusion that Mecca was not an important business place during Muhammad's time? The problem is, Sam, where are you getting this material? That Muhammad, See, everything you're going to tell me now, everything, any Muslim, not you're not a Muslim, but any time that you say that Mecca was a place that they fought against, who, when, where, wh where are you getting this from? You're getting it from the traditions. You're getting that from Al-Buhari. You're getting that from Ibn Hisham. You're getting that from Al-Tabari. I've just given you three sources where you can where you get that, that story, that he was in Medina fighting against the Meccans. He was fighting against the Quraysh. And you have the Battle of Badr, and you have the Battle of Uhud, and you have the Battle of the Trenches. These battles, you don't even know about. You don't even know about these battles unless you go to these traditions. Those traditions about, Mecca, about Muhammad being in Medina fighting against Mecca are from the 9th and 10th century. In the 9th and 10th century, Mecca existed. In the 9th and 10th century, the Kaaba was in Mecca. In the 9th and 10th century, you can, we're gonna tell you in two weeks where the Kaaba was introduced into Mecca. We're gonna tell you even the date that it happened. I'm gonna show all this in about two weeks, but hold on for two weeks. But everything you're gonna come back to me on, every reference you have to Mecca or Medina are from the 9th and 10th century. That's way, way too late. That's two to 300 years. I don't want you to tell me about the 9th and 10th century. It's, that's what I don't trust. I hope you got that from today's lecture. I don't trust the 9th and 10th century because it's two, hundreds of miles away 
and hundreds of years too late. It's for those two reasons that we need to go back to the seventh century. So if any, and this is what you can do, Sam, and when Muslims throw this question at you, throw it right back in their laps and say, hold on, hold on, please don't keep telling me about what you have been told, this classical account from the ninth and tenth century. Tell me what's happening from the seventh century. Show me anything to support what you're just saying from the seventh century. Then we can have a discussion. Are you following me? This is why this is so easy now. You're gonna find it's very easy to use this material uh, with your Muslim friends. Okay, then we have Anil Kumar. I th Sir, what we are trying to establish by showing, what are we trying to establish by showing the inconsistency between the direction of the mosque givers in the text of the Quran? Oh, don't worry about that. Yeah, Anil, don't worry about the, the text. I'm just saying this is, what, this is what Muslims believe, that it was changed towards Mecca, according to chapter 2, verse 145 to 149. They have to go with the Quran. Remember, the Quran doesn't come into existence until the 8th century. So by the 8th century, Mecca did exist. The Kaaba was there. They were now all facing towards Mecca. If, uh, if those who were under, well, let's be careful. <clears throat> the 8th century is when the Ibn Zubair started the Kaaba in Mecca, and the Abbasids, that started all their mosques. All their mosques were facing towards Mecca. But in the mid 8th century is then when all the mosques, then all of them began to start facing towards Mecca. Before that, it was the Umayyads. None of the Umayyad mosques are facing towards Mecca. I'm kind of jumping ahead. I don't want to get into that because that's in two weeks. We're going to show you what we mean by that. Uh, but the only reason why we bring that up in the Quran is because Muslims say it has to be Mecca because the Quran says so. But the Quran also was written in, after Abdul Malik. The Quran is introduced after Abdul Malik. This will all make sense in two weeks. Usually I do this all in one lecture, but it's so long. It takes about two to three hours to get through this lecture. We're splitting it up in two sections. So I'm going to get into this. You'll understand it more after two weeks where we're going with this. In Pennington, hi, Dane and Judy, you asked this question. Could you comment on our acceptance of oral tradition leading up to Moses' authorship of our early books in the Bible versus period, uh, the suspicions you have referred to for the Quranic authorship? Yeah, that's not a problem. And I, I want to be careful because we accept the oral traditions of the of, uh, books of Moses, and uh, we accept them because everything that they are written on, we can support. That's the difference. See, we're not making claims that we can't support historically. I remember when Wellhausen came up with his whole hypothesis that you can't accept the first 11 chapters of Genesis because they talk about people that, well, they talk about Moses and there was no writing in, in 1400 BC. They, no one knew how to write that already. So how could Moses have written down these five books? Well, we now know that uh, since 1905, we have now found hundreds of civilizations, not hundreds, tens of civilizations that could read and write back up until the fifth century BC, uh, 500 BC. I'm sorry, 5000 BC. So the, the writing was, has been around for thousands of years, long before Moses. The reference was, you know, we can't find any reference to a man named Abraham, and therefore he's nothing more than fiction. That was until the Nuzi tablets and the Mari tablets were discovered in the last century. The Mari tablets and the Nuzi tablets are both from Mesopotamia. They're both in the area Abraham lived, and they both talk about the same traditions, the exact same customs that we read in the Genesis account that are, that are found in the Abrahamic story. What's interesting, those customs all, customs all went out of date. They no longer were viable after 1600 BC. Abraham was living in 1900 BC, and yet Moses was writing in 1400 BC. So how could Moses, having never been to Mesopotamia, not living at the time period when those customs would still be in process, how could he have known about all these customs so accurately? How did he get every one of these customs correct? He had no access to the Nuzi tablets or the Mari tablets. He never was from Mesopotamia. We only found those in the last century. And yet everything we see about the Abrahamic story has historical precedence. Look at the five cities that Abraham destroyed. Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Zebulun, and Zorah. Those are five cities found in Genesis chapter 14, verse 8. Those five cities, two of them, Sodom and Gomorrah, have never been found in any historical uh, uh, documentation at all. They're not referred to in any historical documentation. And that's why many scholars in the 18th and 19th century, up until the 20th century, thought that the Bible was nothing more than myths and legend. Certainly these two cities were nothing more than mythological cities. That was until the Ebla tablets were discovered in the 1950s. There underneath this tell, as they dug down to the 2300 year period, 2300 BC period, they came across these, these tablets 
that had been dis that uh, the whole city had been destroyed, and they found seventeen thousand tablets written on clay, and they found one tablet, the names of Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Zeboim, and Zorah, in the same order that we find in Genesis fourteen eight. That's four hundred years before Abraham, proving that Sodom and Gomorrah lived certainly were in existence four hundred years before Abraham. What's more, look at the sequence of those five cities; they're following the same sequence that you find in Genesis fourteen eight. Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed in 1900 BC. How could Moses have known to write those five cities in that sequence? Because what we now know, if you look on a map, those five cities follow a, a route, a trade route on a map. That's the trade route that started Sodom, went to Gomorrah, went to Adma, Zebu, and Zor. That would have been well known in 2300 BC, also well known in 1900 BC. But Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed by God in 1900 BC. How can Moses have known to write it in 1400 BC when those cities no longer existed? Ooh, I love my Bible. So this whole thing about oral tradition, if this had all been passed down orally, then you would expect all this to be an error. The fact that none of this is an error, the fact that we can support, in fact, um, what's his name? Um, this, fam this famous archaeologist from Israel. He says, and I can't remember his name off the top of my head. He says, there has not been one artifact. Not one artifact has been found. Not one mural, not one obelisk, not one tablet, not one piece of evidence has been found that controverts a properly understood biblical statement. We can't find one artifact. And I put it up, and I've been saying this for 40 years to Muslims. Show me one artifact that you can find that controverts a properly understood biblical statement, including all the historical claims that we have in the Old Testament. Now, we can't find support for them exhaustively, but we can't find anything to controvert them. That's the problem that the, these the skeptics have. They can't find anything to confront the, the, the historical record of the Bible. What we're showing here with this lecture, we're confronting the Quran right, left, and center. We're confronting the whole notion that there was a place called Mecca. We're confronting the whole notion that all the mosques are facing towards Mecca. We're confronting that. We'll be doing that in two weeks. And we're confronting the whole problem of the geography, all these people's names like Ad, Thamud, and Midian. They do not exist down in Mecca. They're 600 miles further north. We're confronting it. And that's why we don't have this problem in the Bible. This is unique to the Bible. And that's why uh, that if, it was been, if it had only been built on oral tradition, if God had not preserved his word, God is able to do so. And that's why we can trust the Bible. Because when it makes a historical claim on a name or a date or a place or an event, in a time period, when it makes any one of those five claims, we pretty well know that the Bible can be substantiated. The Bible cannot to be found at fault. No one doing oral tradition could have that great a book, except, of course, the Bible itself. Okay. Um, why pilgrimage, sir? Is that must be for every Muslim? Yes, every Muslim must go on a pilgrimage. Uh, they, the pilgrimage, that's one of the, uh, one of the uh, four of the five pillars the last pillar is Hajj. Everybody in their lifetime must go to Mecca at one point in their lifetime. If they're infirm or if they're too old to do so, they can have someone do it for them. But they must go on the pilgrim. That's one of the five pillars, one of the five practices of Islam, called the Deen of Islam. That's why it's important. We'll talk more about that in two weeks. SPS, has anyone used the minimal facts method popularized by Dr. Gary Habermas to make the case of Christ's resurrection to establish specific reliability in the Quran, showing the central doctrine of Islam as historical fact. The, I'm not sure what you mean. If SPS, if you could email me and let me know what you mean by minimal facts method. I'm not familiar. I know Derry, uh, Dr. Gary Habermas. I know he's the world authority on the resurrection. But if you can ask, let, spell that out a little bit more as to what the question is, uh, I'd love to answer it. I'm sure there is, but I'm not. I, I, until I understand the question, I won't be able to answer what would be the results? Uh, I'm not sure what that would be. Oh, of, of the minimal uh, facts method. Good. Email me and let me know what you're talking about there. And then the last question, it says uh, from Sam Theophilus, how far is this idol worship of Muhammad related to Hindu idols? Nowadays, Hindu uh, outfits claiming Kaaba is an, a Shiva temple. How far is that correct? There are some of the customs like circling the idols and worshiping pictures similar to Hindu worship and yoga posture. Um, you know, I don't know much about the whole Shiva temple. I know on my Fander films, there's a fellow that's always there asking me this question. Could you please talk about the Shiva temple? Could you please talk about the Shiva temple? If you could ask, tell me, Sam, what the Shiva temple is about. You've got my email. If you could email me what you know about the Shiva temple, I'd be able to answer that. I have not looked at Hinduism versus Islam 
at all. And I'm not, I have no doubt that some of the material um, that, that Islam uses today is borrowed from Hinduism. We do know that many of the scientific proofs, uh, many of the scientific discoveries uh, that Muslims claim to have come through Islam were almost all came from India. And they did come from Hinduism. And they came from China and India, but mostly from India, like algebra, the whole numerical system, trigonometry. This all comes from India. The Muslims did not invent it. They just took what the Indians gave them, and then they basically put their name to it and claimed it for themselves. So certainly that is true. Uh, I would have no, I would not be surprised if also the whole functions of the, the five functions of the pilgrimage that you have uh, may have come, but I will probably shut that down next in two weeks because we do know if you look at the five functions of the Hajj, when you look at every one of those five functions, they ha are all found in the city we are going to introduce in two weeks. The city where all these mosques are facing, we also find that everything that's in the Hajj today is found in that city. And even more so is even more specific and more correct. In fact, we'll probably do a whole talk just on what we now know about that city. But that's not for now. That's not for today. And it's not even for two weeks from now. Listen, I see I've gone way over time. I'm way over two hours. I know it's late for you. It's uh, after 930 for you. It's coming up to 10 o'clock. So I don't want to take this any longer. Thanks for your questions. This has been a good uh, chance to be with you. Uh, in two weeks, we're going to continue the second half and finish off. We're getting into the much more exciting material. Uh, I think the, you're going to see. Wait till you see what, where these mosques are facing and wait till you see why they're facing in these four directions. Uh, wait till you see what we do not know. And then we're going to answer the question, so what did happen? What do we think now happened? <clears throat> that I'm going to answer in two weeks, okay? God bless you all, you men and women. You look great. I'm glad to have been with you. I'm glad that we have this time together. Uh, let's see you in two weeks, and we'll continue with this talk then. This is Jay here in the United States on the East Coast. I'm looking at all you now. You're looking great. We'll see you in two weeks. Hey, Bonnie, I see you as well. Way there in Turkey. There's my sister in Turkey. Okay. We'll see you all. Come back in two weeks, and we'll actually get to the much, much more meaty material, the much more exciting material, and then we'll come and show you how Islam really began. From what we know in April 2020, from April 2020, I may have to change it in another year because we're coming up with so much new material. In fact, it's almost coming up almost every week. We're getting some new material. You'll see that on Fander Films. Look at the stuff we just put up in the last week. It keeps on exponentially growing. It's great. It's fun. This is exciting to have you guys and gals with us. We'll see you in two weeks. This is Jay here in Pennsylvania. Over and out. God be with you.